book called The Master Algorithm, which I very much enjoyed reading. Uh, he's the winner of the SIG KDD Innovation Award, which is the highest award in data science, a fellow at AAAI, and he's received many, many other awards, which I won't uh, read all of those. Um, but uh, what he's going to talk about today is the five tribes of machine learning. And if you look at his book, you know this is uh, very much in the spirit of some of the work he's been doing in that area. So please join me in welcoming Pedro. start with a very simple question. Where does knowledge come from? Let me start with a very simple question. Where does knowledge come from? In the past, it came from just three sources. Evolution, that's the knowledge that's encoded in your DNA. Experience, that's knowledge that's encoded in your neurons. And culture, the knowledge that you acquire by, you know, reading books, speaking with other people, and so on. Now, what's really remarkable is that in only just the last few decades, even last a few, you know, years, a new source of knowledge has appeared on the planet, and that source is computers. And notice that the emergence of each of these forms of knowledge discovery was a major milestone in the history of life on Earth. Well, evolution, well, that's life itself. Experience is what, you know, distinguishes, you know, us mammals from, from insects. Culture is what makes humans what we are and, and, and as successful as we are. And the emergence of computers as a new source of knowledge is going to be every bit as momentous as every one of these was. And it's, it's just in, the begin in its beginnings today. Notice also that each of these... Uh, sources of knowledge discovers orders of magnitude more knowledge than the previous ones and, it, and does it orders of magnitude faster. Like culture is much, much, you know, you, you, you acquire you know, like by reading a book, like, you know, somebody's lifetime of knowledge, you know, you by experience can acquire in a day, you know, something that evolution might have taken a million years to do. And, and computers are going to be a similar leap. In fact, Yann LeCun, who is the director of AI research at Facebook and a very famous machine learning researcher, says that most of the knowledge in the world in the future is going to be extracted by machines and will reside in machines. So this is really something that I think everybody, not just scientists or, you know, or, you know even uh, you know, us as citizens and consumers, we need to understand you know, what, what's happening here and, and what it means for, for what we do. So, so how do computers discover new knowledge? Well, this is, of course, the province of machine learning. And really what I'm going to try to do in this talk is give you, you know, a 15-minute overview of, of what machine learning is. If you're already familiar with machine learning, this will hopefully give you a new angle, a new kind of like view on the, on the field. If you're not familiar with machine learning yet or only superficially familiar with it, this should be a very useful 15 minutes. So there are five main ways in which uh, computers discover new knowledge. The first one is to fill in the gaps in their existing knowledge a little bit like scientists have worked to formulate hypotheses, test them, you know, see what's missing, etc., etc. The second one, very popular these days, is to emulate the brain. Another one is to simulate evolution. Another one uh, that comes from statistics, from Bayesian statistics in particular, is to realize that all knowledge that is learned from data is necessarily uncertain. And so we want to quantify that uncertainty and then systematically reduce it. And the more we reduce it, the, the more knowledge we have. And the final one, which is something that I think is, is, is what we you know, do every day in our lives, is, is to reason by analogy, is to notice similarities between you know, the new situation that we're in and the ones that we've been before and try to transfer some of the knowledge from one to the other. And associated with each of these ways of discovering new knowledge uh, is a major paradigm in machine learning. There's a whole school of thought associated with each one of these approaches. And, you know, machine learning, not only is it very important these days, it's also, to my mind, a really fun and fascinating field to study because each of these paradigms comes from a different field of science. And so under the guise of studying machine learning, you actually get to study, you know, just about everything that, that you might be interested in. So, for example, you know, so, so there are five major tribes, you know, the five major schools of thought. 
the symbolists, connectionists, evolutionaries, visions, and analogizers. The symbolists are the ones that discover knowledge by filling in gaps in the existing knowledge. And they have their origins very much in things like logic and philosophy and, and you know, they're the most computer science-y of the five types, if you will. The connectionists, of course, since their goal is to emulate the brain, they have their origins in, in neuroscience. Uh, the evolutionaries and, of course, evolutionary biology, the Bayesians come from statistics. The analogizers from a number of different sources, but the, the most important one, I would say, is, is psychology, because, as I said, there's a lot of evidence that, that this is how people work. Each of these tribes also has its own master algorithm, an algorithm that, in principle, can discover any knowledge from data. In fact, for each of these algorithms, there's a mathematical proof that if you give it enough data, it can learn any function. For the, for the symbolist, the mass problem is inverse deduction. Uh, we'll see in just a little bit what that is. For the connection, it's, it's backpropagation, or backprop for short. For the evolutionaries, it's genetic programming. For the Bayesians, it's probabilistic inference using Bayes' theorem. And for the analogizers, uh, you know, the most widely used method is kernel machines, uh, also used as support vector machines. And what I'm really going to do here is just try to give you the essential ideas of each one of these five. And of course, there's much more to machine learning than these five algorithms, but, but they really, I think, capture the essence of each of, its, of, each, of the corresponding tribe. So uh, let me start with the symbolists. So here are some of the world's most prominent symbolists. There's Tom Mitchell at CNU, Steve Muggleton at Imperial College in the UK, and, and Ross Quinlan uh, in Australia. And the, the basic idea behind symbolic learning is, is a really, really brilliant idea. It was actually uh, first proposed in the, in the late 19th century by the economist and philosopher uh, William Jevons. But it was only turned into, you know, algorithms, you know, the, in, in, the, in the 90s. And the idea is the following. <coughs> Induct, right, learning, right, is, is induction. It's going from specific facts to general rules. In contrast to deduction, which is going from general rules to specific facts. Now, deduction we understand very well, but induction we don't. But the analogy here is that induction is the inverse of deduction in the same way that subtraction is the inverse of addition, or integration is the inverse of differentiation. So there's a long and distinguished history in mathematics of making progress by having an operation that you understand very well, and then defining one that you don't, but trying to figure out what it has to be, even what it's the inverse of. And so what we're going to do here, you know, for learning from data, is something very similar. So to pursue that analogy, addition gives you the answer to a question like, if I add 2 and 2, what do I get, right? The answer, of course, being 4, and this being the deepest thing that you'll hear in this whole talk. <laughs> Subtraction, however, gives us the answer to the inverse question, which is, what do I have to add to 2 in order to get 4? And the analogy here is the following. Deduction gives us answers to questions like, if I know that Socrates is human and that humans are mortal, what else do I know? What can I infer from that? And the answer, of course, is that, well, Socrates is mortal too. Now, induction gives us the answer to the inverse question, which is, if I know that Socrates is human, what else do I need to know in order to conclude that Socrates is mortal? Right? And notice that this, and the answer, of course, is that humans are mortal. Notice that these are specific facts about Socrates, and this is a general rule. So we just saw how to go from specific facts to a general rule. And if we have a lot of data, and we do this a lot of times, we will learn a lot of rules, which we can then combine in arbitrary ways to potentially answer questions that are very, very different from anything that we ever saw in the data. So symbolists had a lot of store by this ability to learn knowledge that is composable. I have one rule, I have another rule, I chain them, I get another result. They're actually the only ones that can do this. And of course, computers do not understand natural language. Uh, you know, I wrote this in English here, but that's not how it works on a computer. They will use something like first-order logic, for example, like, which you can think of as a more formal version of natural language. But the basic idea is the same. <coughs> and as I mentioned, this is the type of learning that is closest to how scientists work. And in fact, one of its most interesting applications is, is, is this one right here. Mm -hmm. So, this is not very reliable. I no, mean, of course, of course. So, I, I should preface everything that I'm going to say with, like, what I'm going to give you is a very oversimplified cartoon of how things are working, particularly here. I would never do this. What I would have is something like, 
Socrates is human and Socrates is immortal. Aristotle is human and Aristotle is mortal. Plato is uh, like I have a hundred right. things like right. that. And then from those, I can conclude that yes. But then the question is like, should I just... Greek. But it's still... <laughs> no, well, no, I was about to get to that. I was going to ask the slide that she's like, but why don't I just conclude that philosophers are mortal? Right? And one of the principles that we use is this, this notion that Newton actually made explicit, right, in, in, the, in the Principia. It's like, you know, make the, make the largest possible generalization that you can. Which sounds like a very rash thing to do, but actually turns out to work very well. So, you know, so for example, we can say, well, generalize to the largest class that you can. In which case, you know, uh, well, if we didn't have negative examples, it would be everybody, right? But, but, yeah. but humans, are, humans are more general than Greeks and, and more than, you know, philosophers and whatnot. But it remains inductive. It just gets better and better. No, absolutely. So notice, um, actually, let, let me give you a, a, what I think is a good number here. You know how you know when you integrate, right? You only get the result up to a constant, yes. right? We have to make a similar choice here, right? And and, and, and you know, and, and this rule of making the largest generalization you can is a little bit like setting the constant to zero. Okay. So sorry, what was your question again? No, it was the same thing. It remains inductive. It just gets better and better. But yes, it never so gets as precise as deduction. It does not. But but here's the good news, right? Um, you know, Leslie Valiant, uh, you know, the other street at Harvard, won the Turing Award for basically proving that you can actually have guarantees on induction. They are not deterministic guarantees like you have on, on uh, you know, on, on deduction. Yeah. But they, they're probabilistic. But still, as you get more data, and if the class of hypothesis that you that you're considering is constrained and fits that data, you become increasingly confident that you actually form the correct induction. But you're never sure, of course. Okay. Which also leads us to you know Bayesian learning and you know the explicit dealing with the probabilities and whatnot. And you can combine these two, which is getting a little bit ahead of the story. But again, more questions. Okay, very good. So I was saying that. This is a little bit inspired by how scientists work, right? You, you know, there's a gap in your knowledge, you formulate a hypothesis, and then you test the hypothesis, maybe discard it, maybe you refine it. And, and one, you know, famous application of symbolic learning is, is doing exactly that for science. So, for example, if you look at this picture, the biologist is not the guy in the lab code. The guy in the lab code is actually a machine learning researcher by the name of Ross King. The biologist in this picture is this machine here. This is a complete bio robot biologist in the box. It starts out with, you know, basic knowledge of molecular biology, DNA, proteins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, you know, just, you know, you just say, well, you're going to study yeast cells now. And then it learns what it can about yeasts, and then it formulates hypotheses using inverse deduction, and then it, it, it actually designs experiments to test those hypotheses and physically carries them out using, you know, microarrays and sequences and whatnot, which is what you see here. And then it refines those hypotheses and so on. So it really is very much like a biologist at work. And, you know, like this robot is called Eve. It's the second one the person was called, guess what, Adam. And, 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 a, and a couple of years ago, Eve actually discovered the new malaria drug. And once you have a robot scientist like this, there's nothing stopping you from making a million of them. And now you're making progress a million times faster, and they don't get tired, they don't sleep, they don't get grumpy, they don't make you know all those human foibles that we know not about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So this is the sim you know the simplest approach to learning. The connectionists are skeptical of all of this. They say, well, trying to do learning the way you know scientists and mathematicians and logicians work is too abstract. It's too artificial, too rigid. This is not really going to be useful for a lot of the learning that we have to do, like things like perception, for example, or motor control and whatnot. For that, what we should actually do is take inspiration from the greatest learning algorithm on Earth, the one inside your skull, right? In engineering, when you're behind the competition, what you do is you open up the box and you reverse engineer it. We are definitely behind the competition when it comes to AI. So let's open up the box and, and try to see if we can reverse engineer it. So the idea in connectionism is to try to understand at least to some degree how the brain works and then implement that as, as a learning algorithm. And the leader of the connectionist is, is Jeff Hinton. Uh, he actually started life as a psychologist. These days he's more of a computer scientist and he splits his time between Google and the University of Toronto where, where he's been for a long time. And, and you know, Jeff, he really believes that the way the human brain learns can be captured by a single, not too complex algorithm. 
And he spent you know, the last 40 years, he started in the 70s, trying to discover that algorithm. He's been incredibly determined and persistent. In fact, he's, you know, he tells the story of coming home from work one day you know, and saying to his family, yay, I did it, I did it, I figured out how the brain works. And, and, and his daughter replied, oh, dad, not again. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's the first one to admit that he's had, you know, that his quest has had its ups and downs. But the bottom line is, it's, it's really starting to pay off. So, in particular, Jeff was one of the co-inventors of backpropagation, uh, which these days, under the, you know, under the moniker of, of, of deep learning, is really, you know, taking over the world. Like, you probably have it in your cell phone right now doing speech recognition and, and you, know, you, know, you know, Google and Microsoft use it to place ads and to, you know, to, to choose search results and image search and, and on and on. And two other famous ones are, are Yan Lucha and, and, and Yoshio Bengio, one of the last remaining deep learning researchers who hasn't been bought by industry for millions of dollars. <laughs> We're relying on him to produce all the PhD students that they go to everybody else's labs. <laughs> I, I, you know, like every year I, I email the people saying, like, you know, do you have promising postdocs? And the last time I did that with, with Yasha, I said, like, I can't even hold to them onto them before they graduate. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I, I, I have that experience too. So, what's the basic idea here? The brain is made of neurons. We're going to build the simplest mathematical model of the neuron that we can. And then build a network out of those, and then figure out how to train that network the same way that your brain, or roughly, you know, the same way that the brain works. And the neuron, as I'm sure you know, is a very unusual kind of cell. Right? It doesn't just have a cell body. It, it, it looks a little bit like a microscopic tree. Right? So it has this big, long trunk. It can be really long. like It can go from one side of your brain to the other, uh, called the axon. And then the axon branches out into, you know, into dendrites. And then this is why this is different from, you know, your brain is a little bit like a forest, but at this point it becomes even more nightmarish, if you will, in that the branches of one tree make contact with the roots of other trees. So your brain is the most tangled forest that you have ever seen by far. And the places where the dendrites of one neuron make contact with the with the with outgoing dendrites make contact with the incoming dendrites of another, those are called synapses. And the efficiency of the process, and, and, and literally, you know, when, a, when an axon fires, there's an electrical discharge, when a neuron fires, there's an electrical discharge that gets sent on the axon. And that, to oversimplify a little bit, deposits charge, you know, at the synapse to the next neurons. And now the synapses can be more or less efficient in terms of, you know, transmitting that charge to the receiving neuron. So the connection can be weaker or stronger. And there's something called, you know, Hebb's rule that says neurons that fire together wire together. Which means that the more that two neurons fire at the same time, the easier it becomes for the first, for the, you know, for the upstream one to, 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 to make the downstream one fire. And this is we actually, you know, have, you know, his work back in the 50s, we actually now know the biochemical process by which this happens. It's called long-term potentiation. And, you know, and this is to the best of our knowledge how everything that you know Everything that you've ever learned is just encoded in the strengths of the connections between them. Okay. So now our goal is going to be to, to you know, model this mathematically and then implement it on the computer. So here's a model of a neuron. Notice the correspondence between every part of this diagram and the, and, the, and, the, and the parts of the cell. So what is the cell body going to do? It has incoming connections from the other neurons, and each of these connections has a weight. Okay. And the weight varies by... Our entire learning process is just going to consist of varying these weights. So the neuron does a weighted sum of its inputs, and then if that weighted sum is above a threshold, then it fires, meaning then the output will be 1, otherwise it will be 0. So for, so, and this input could be other neurons, or it could just be the retina, right? We often call the, you know, literally the input the, the retina. And let's say that what you have here is, you know, is your grandmother, right? And this is the famous grandmother cell, right? And, and, and when you see your grandmother, the grandmother cell should fire. If it doesn't fire, that means there's something to learn. Or if it fires when instead of seeing your grandmother, you just see, you know, your cousin, then, then there's also something to learn. Okay. Now, this is, you know, simple, you know, almost trivial, you know, it was proposed back in the 50s by someone named Frank Rosenblatt. The whole question is what happens when you have a whole network of these. And for many decades, people really couldn't come up with a good way to learn the weights when you have a very complex network. And it's not that hard to see why, because, you know, think of one little neuron here, like this, you know, the purple circle in the middle of the network. 
And, and yes, this is your grandmother, and, and it should have, this guy should have been farming, the output should have been one, but it's actually just point 0.2. Okay, well, how is this neuron responsible for that or not, right? You know, how, you know, how should I change each of these weights to make the system do better? This is an instance of what a machine learning is called the credit assignment problem, and it's one of the key problems in machine learning. Maybe a better name for it would be the blame assignment problem because it's about deciding who to blame when things are going wrong, right? If the neuron is making is producing the wrong output, then who do I need to change? And that propagation is a solution. It's the best known solution to that problem, and it was, um, you know, uh, proposed in the 80s by by a bunch of, uh, of, of psychologists, uh, you know, David Romerhart and and and, Jeff Hinton and, and Ron Williams. And the the basic idea in backprop is very very simple. It's just the following. So this output, let's say I wanted it to be one, but it's just point two. So let me try to wiggle, let me try to change each of these weights in turn a little bit. If I increase this weight a little bit while keeping everything else the same, what happens to this? If the, if the air goes down, then, then maybe I should make that change to the weight and vice versa. Okay, and you just do this for one weight at a time and then and you keep doing this until hopefully you know, your air is very low and you, then you've learned what you want to learn. Now, of course, if you did do this one way at a time, this would just be hopelessly inefficient. I mean, these days we have, you know, networks with billions of weights, so you'd never be done. So backprop is really just a very clever, efficient way of doing this, you know, it's, it's, the backprop is short for air <coughs> back propagation because what you do is like, you propagate the signal to the output and then you measure the air and then from, from, and then, and then you change the weights from going back one layer at a time. You first see how much you need to change these weights. And then, and then, of course, you know, this air is a function of these weights and these inputs. So then, based on the results of this, of this, you know, computation, you see how much these weights should change. So you go back one layer at a time, reusing your results, which makes this now efficient enough to use. So that's really backprop in a nutshell. And as I mentioned, these days, backprop is used for just about everything on that, right? Every, every day we see in the, in the newspapers a new success of, of, of deep learning. By the way, Deep learning is called deep learning because it's it's just neural networks with many layers, right? The ne a network with many layers is this, you know, or hidden layers as they call it because neither the input nor the output is that's that's what we call a deep network. Yeah. And then as I was saying, you know, this you know hardly a day goes by where you don't hear about some new success of deep learning in the papers. The most famous one is probably still the one that was on the on page one of the New York Times a few years ago. That was actually the first time I think I ever saw, you know, like the first page story in the New York Times about machine learning, these days it's kind of like not that, that uncommon to see this. And this was the Google Cat Network. So the Google Cat Network at the time was the largest network ever built. It had, you know, hundreds of millions of weights. You know, these days, you know, billions are, are quite common. And, 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 what, and, and you know, what they did, right, it, you know, I mean, it was called the Cat Network because it recognized, you know, the, the thing they recognized best was cats. Uh, maybe a better name, you know, um, the net, let me tell you how this was learned, right? What they did was they had the network watch many, 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 many hours of YouTube videos. Okay. So maybe a better name would have been, you know, the Couch Potato Network, because that's what it was. It was a Couch Potato. But it was called the, the Google Cat Network because the single best thing that it did was recognize cats. And, you know, and the journalists picked up on that. And the, well, the reason why the single best thing it recognized was cats, by the way, is that people just love to post videos of their cats on YouTube. So there was more data about cats than, than about anything else. ImageNet, if you heard of ImageNet, on the other hand, it has more dogs than anything else. So uh, it's all between cats and dogs. So, um, but you know, but it, it did recognize you know other animals and people and whatnot in, in you know much better than than, than anything that had gone before. And, in, and things have kept on getting better ever since. Now the evolutionaries they look at all this and they go, well, sure, you know, connection is a big deal. Right? It just tweaks the weights on your brain, but, but where did the brain come from? Right? Connectionists actually have to design a priori the architecture of the network, and that is a lot of work, and that can take a long time. And of course, the evolutionaries are like, you don't have to do that. There's an answer to that question. Right? Your brain was designed by evolution, and then you know, once it's been designed by evolution, we, we can tweak the weights using backprop, no big deal. And we, all, we understand roughly how evolution works. So let's implement that on the computer and see what it, what we can come up with, right? The difference is that this time instead of evolution, instead of evolving animals and plants, we're going to evolve programs. We're going to evolve, you know, the models of systems or whatever we want. 
And the person who first ran away with this idea was, was John Holland. Uh, he started in the late 50s and, and 60s. And, and for a while, people used to joke that you know, evolutionary computing was you know, John Holland and his students and their students. And that was actually not that inaccurate. But then in the 80s, it exploded. So John, you know, John Holland called what he did genetic algorithms. We'll see what a genetic algorithm is in just a second. John Koza came up with a more powerful variant of it called genetic programming, which is the most powerful type of, of you know, evolutionary learning that we know today. And then, you know, Hal Lipson is one of the people who are, you know, uh, today doing some, some very interesting things with, uh, uh, you know, with, with evolutionary learning, as, as we'll see in a little bit. So what's the basic idea in, in a genetic algorithm? Well, think about a cartoon of how evolution works, right? At any given point in time, there's a population of individuals. And each individual is described by a genome. Right? In our case, it's base pairs, but in the case of programs, it can just be a bit string. So we're going to have a bunch of individuals, each described by a bit string. And typically, those start out being completely random. Right? You just you know, create a thousand random bit strings. That, that genome you know, specifies a phenotype, right? it specifies an organism, and then the organism goes out into the real world and you know, does well or doesn't. Right? So we get its fitness value. Right, and this is a term that comes from biology. So we have our programs and we measure the fitness of each program using whatever measure we care about. Okay. And, then the, and then the programs that are the fittest programs get to reproduce. So you literally make parents, right? you create new genomes as a result of crossing over the, the, you know, the mother genome with the father genome, and then you do some mutations you know, randomly, uh, just as in the real world, and now you have a new population, you have a new generation. And the remarkable thing is that if you do this for enough generations, even you start out with essentially garbage at the end of it, you can actually have very sophisticated things. In particular, the you know the genetic uh, algorithms people have made it a sport to you know uh, have their algorithms invent things that they then submit to the patent office, and they've gotten you know more than patents for you know radios and amplifiers and and instruments that actually often work better than the ones that were designed by human engineers, and they work in totally different ways because of course they you know, they're coming at it from a, from a totally different angle. Okay. So, you know, if the Turing test was to fool a patent officer instead of a conversationalist who would have been passed, you know, many years ago. Now, John Cousin's idea was the following. If what we're trying to do is, is we don't have to be that faithful to nature, right? If what we're trying to do is learn programs, a bit string is a very, you know, poor, very low-level encoding. I could have a perfectly good program, and then I randomly cross it over at some point, and it basically destroys a lot of good stuff. So, you know, why, why not make faster progress and hold on to your gains by having a better representation of, of the program? And what would be a better representation? Well, a program is a tree of subroutine calls, right? Subroutines, call subroutines, call sub subroutines, down to simple things like additions and multiplications and, and ands and ors. So, so this is what they do in genetic programming, is, is they represent the program as its tree of subroutines, and then crossover consists of picking a node randomly in each of the trees and swapping the subtrees. Okay? So for example, here, if this was my, 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 my crossover point, then one of the resulting trees would be the one in white. And the tree in white actually is quite meaningful. It's, it's one of Kepler's laws. It's the law that gives the average um, uh, you know, length of, of a planet's year as a function of the average distance from the sun. You know, it's proportional to the, <coughs> to the, to the you, know, you know, the square is proportional to the cube, etc., etc. And this is a very easy thing for a genetic algorithm to learn. But genetic algorithms have learned much more, you know, interesting, you know, things like, for example, you know, uh, you know, people have even used genetic algorithms to learn to play robot soccer, for example. Which brings us to the, one of the more interesting and exciting applications of genetic algorithms these days, which is to evolve not just programs, but actual, you know, real-life physical robots. So this is this spider is actually a real robot from Hudson's lab at Cornell. And they've also evolved dragonflies and, and you know strange monsters that, that you know crawl and, and fly. And the way they do this is they start out in simulation, running the genetic algorithm, and then once once the, the simulated robots are good enough, they get 3D printed. And then they start to walk and crawl into the world. And then in each generation, the fittest robots get to program the 3D printers to produce the next generation of robots. I'm not kidding. This is kind of exciting and kind of scary. Right? 
And if this terminator ever comes to pass, then, then, you know, this may well be the route by which we get it. Of course, you know, these little spiders are not, you know, nowhere near ready to take over the world. But they're kind of, you know, remarkable in that, like, it, this started with a random soup of parts. And actually, it's robust. Like, you know, you can stomp on one leg and it will start to crawl on the other three and, and things like that. So that's, that's uh, evolutionary learning. <coughs> now for the Bayesians. The Bayesians have a very, very different <coughs> attitude to learning. The connections and the evolutionaries, for all their differences, they are both inspired by biology. But actually, most machine learning researchers think of that as a dubious idea. Because, you know, evolution is, is random, right? And there's a lot of crap flying around, you know, with the good stuff. You know, why, why should we be constrained by what, you know, nature produced? What we should do is figure out from first principles what the best way to learn is. And this is very much what the Bayesians have done. And the principle from which learning derives, in their view, is based here. So for Bayesians, you know, all learn... For Bayesians, if a learning algorithm is not an application of Bayes' theorem, then it must be wrong. Okay? So Bayesians are well known from being the most fanatical of the, of the machine learning tribes. You know, and and they, they have to be, because for 200 years they were persecuted minority in statistics, and, and they had to get very hardcore in order to survive. And, you know, and it's a good thing they did, because they have a lot to contribute. And these days with a lot of the, you know, with the computing power and, and data and, and you know, better algorithms, they're actually, they're actually on the rise, even within statistics. Now, within computer science, the best known version is probably Huda Pearl. He actually won the Turing Award, the, the Nobel Prize of Computer Science a few years ago, for inventing something called Bayesian networks, which are Bayesian models of the interactions among very large sets of variables. And they can represent them very efficiently, and they really were a, a big breakthrough. And two other famous Bayesians are David Heckerman and, and, and Mike Jordan. So what is Bayesian learning all about? It's all about Bayes' theory. And Bayesians love Bayes' theorem so much that there was this Bayesian learning startup that had a huge neon sign of Bayes' theorem made and hung outside their offices in, in London, I think this was. You know. So here's Bayesian theorem, and it's so in all its glory for everybody to see. Now, what does this all mean? Now, Bayesian learning is often perceived as very difficult and mathematical, and, and, and in some ways it is very mathematical, but the basic idea in Bayes' theorem is really, really simple. In particular, Bayes' theorem itself, for those of you who are not already familiar with it, it's so simple that it barely merits being called a theorem, except for the fact that it's so important. And the proof of Bayes' theorem is, you know, it's a couple of lines. It's a, it's a direct consequence of the definition of conditional probability. Maybe more important is, like, what does it do? Right? So the idea in Bayesian learning is the following. All this uncertainty, I start off not knowing anything about the world, except that I have a set of hypotheses about what the world is like. And before I even see any data, right, based on my own intuition or, or assumptions or whatever, I think that some hypotheses seem more plausible than others. And I call that the prior probability of the hypothesis. So for each hypothesis, I have a probability that it's true before I even see any data. And by the way, this is, you know, the prior, as it's known for short, is a large part of the reason why Bayesianism is so controversial. <laughs> Because people say, like, well, you, you just make, you're not allowed to just make stuff up like that. What's wrong with you? Like, we're, you know, we're scientists. We're supposed to be objective. And the vision is like, you know, like, you are also making those assumptions. The only difference is that we are making them explicit. And, you know, and I think they have a point there. In particular, what frequently statisticians do, which is maximum likelihood, is a special case of doing this. So in some ways, you actually have, you know, a clear picture of what's going on when you do this. So that's the prior probability. And then... Right? You start seeing evidence. As you see more evidence, the hypotheses that are consistent with the evidence become more probable, and the ones that are inconsistent with the evidence become less likely. Okay? So this term is called the likelihood. Right? It's the probability of the evidence, even the hypothesis, viewed as a function of the hypothesis. Okay? And when you, when you multiply the two, the prior and the likelihood, you get what's called the posterior probability of the hypothesis. This is how much you believe in the hypothesis after you have seen evidence. And it's a function of how much you believe in it before the evidence came in and how consistent it was with the hypothesis. Okay. And then there's this you know, term called the marginal, which is really just to make everything add up to one, and, and we don't really need to worry about it that much for our purposes. And hopefully what will happen is that as you see more evidence, you know, the problem will become concentrated in fewer and fewer hypotheses. This is what typically happens. Until hopefully there's one hypothesis that shines out as the true one, but that may not necessarily happen. You could, at the end of this process, still have a whole bunch of plausible hypotheses, 
And, you know, the Bayesians argue that, like, well, you shouldn't pretend that there's only one possible hypothesis, you know. You should actually, you know, consider all the hypotheses that are consistent with, with the other things. Now, the problem with this is that once you apply, very simple idea, but once you apply it to large hypothesis spaces, like, for example, vision networks, this all becomes highly, highly, highly computationally intractable. But a lot of the work that people have done is come up with clever methods to do that inference, things like Markov chain Monte Carlo and, you know, variational inference and with propagation. And with those and the kind of computers that we have today, we can actually do a lot of good stuff with this. And, you know, for example, your first driving car will probably have a vision network in its brain. So, you know, so vision network can do a lot of stuff like that. One, one application, however, that, it, that, that we are already today, you know, very much familiar with and even dependent on is this spam filter. So David Heffernan's idea was to apply, you know, vision learning to the problem of deciding whether, and he was, he was at, you know, he is at Microsoft Research, um, and, you know, they were having this big problem with spam. And, and, and so the idea here is like, I'm going to just consider two hypotheses. This email is spam, and this email is not spam. Okay, so this, you know, so I'm going to compute the probability of each of those, and, and if it's more likely to be spam, then I will, you know, I will get rid of it. And the evidence is the contents of the email. So, for example, if the email contains the word free in all capitals, that makes it more likely to be spam. If, in addition, it contains the word Viagra, that makes it even more likely to be spam. And if it then has four exclamation marks, then it's almost certain to be spam. On the other hand, if it has your best friend's name on the, you know, on the byline, then on the signature line, then, you know, then maybe it's not spam. Okay. So this is vision learning. Now, finally, let's look at, at you know, analogy-based learning. Probably the most famous analogizer is Vladimir Ratnik. He invented support vector machines, which until deep learning took over were the leading machine learning uh, method. And actually for many, uh, you know, quick parenthesis, right? like this, this is all you hear about is deep learning, but for many problems, in fact for most problems, it's either still typically either analogy-based or symbolic learning methods like random force that actually are, are the, the best ones. So we uh, tend to keep in mind. So Vladimir Vapnik invented kernel machines, so also known as support vector machines. The earliest analogy-based machine learning algorithm, in some sense the first real machine learning algorithm you know, in the universe that wasn't just statistics, was, was the nearest neighbor algorithm. It was the first algorithm for which there actually was a theorem saying, if you give it enough data, it can learn anything. And Peter Hart was one of the two people that, that proved that theorem and, and, there, and thereby made uh, you know, this type of learning take off back in the, in the 60s. Another very famous analogizer, in fact, the person who coined the term analogizer is Douglas Hofstadter, you know, the author of Gödel Escherbach, which itself is an extended analogy between, you know, Gödel's theorem and Bach's music and, and Escher's art. And, 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 and you know, um, Doug's new book is actually 500 pages mm -hmm. arguing that everything about learning, everything about cognition is just analogy. So he really, really believes that analogy is, is the master algorithm, and you know, and, and, and you know, he's, you know, one of his chapters about how like all the great scientists in history, like from you know Einstein and Newton and Galois and whatnot, they really all he shows how what they were doing in essence was was reasoning by analogy, as well as you know the everyday reasoning by analogy that we all do. So how does this work? Let's start with nearest neighbor, which is the simplest. Nearest neighbor is not just the simplest. Analogy-based learning algorithm is the simplest learning algorithm you can imagine. The, the nearest neighbor algorithm basically consists at learning time of doing nothing. Sometimes these types of methods are called lazy learning because, you know, the others are eager. They do a lot of work. It's like students, right? They, they study before the exam, right? Lazy learning is like you don't study for the exam, and then when the time comes, you improvise. Okay? Now, your mom told you that procrastination is a bad thing, but actually machine learning it can be a very good thing. It can actually be a very powerful thing to do so. So here's how the nearest neighbor algorithm works. I'm going to explain by way of proposing you a little puzzle. So here's the puzzle. I give you a map of two countries. Okay? But the only thing, you know, I pause this time in Megaland because one is going to have the positive examples, which are examples of the concept. Let's say, you know, the concept of, you know, this person has a tumor, uh, you know, real example, and, you know, these are the negative examples. But all I'm going to do is give you the locations of the cities in each of these countries. So now there's positive ill, the capital of Pakistan, here are other positive cities, and here are negative cities. Another, another, another the, the puzzle is, is this. Can you tell me where the border between the two countries is from just where the main cities are? Okay. 
Now, you probably can't answer that question exactly because, you know, the, the cities do not determine the location of the border, but that is the essence of the machine learning problem, <laughs> right? It's what's called the nil post problem in, in mathematics. But you can probably form a reasonably good guess, right, by kind of drawing a line that goes somewhere between, you know, the, the, the two kinds of cities. And this is exactly what nearest neighbor does. In particular, nearest neighbor just uses the following principle. It says, I'm going to say that a point is in Kazakhstan point on the map is in Kazakhstan, if it's closer to some positive city than to any negative city on the map. Okay? So I'm in essence going to divide the map into the neighborhoods of all the cities. And then Kazakhstan is just the union of all the regions of the positive cities. And, and, and same with for Negoland. And when you do that, you get this boundary here. So for example, this line is the set of points that are at the same distance you know, to this and this. And then these points here, of course, are closer to this one, therefore they're in Kazakhstan and so forth. Okay. So all the nearest neighbor has to do is remember the data. And then at, at test time, right, when a new patient comes into your office and you're the doctor, are like, well, what does this patient have? You just riffle through your files, right, and see the, find the patient with the most similar symptoms and say, like, oh, this patient had malaria, so you must have malaria as well. And this may sound ridiculous, but it's actually, if you do diagnosis using this algorithm, you will typically do better than, than highly trained you know, human doctors. And again, if you give it enough data, eventually it'll, it'll learn you know, any, any function uh, uh, perfectly. You know, a slightly you know, more sophisticated version of this is called Chambers study. That's, uh, that's a detail. Now, there's a couple of shortcomings of this scheme. You know, one is that this bundle is a little bit more jagged than it should be. Right? It's this bunch of like straight lines and real frontiers aren't really like that. Right? It should be smooth, at least intuitively. So that's one problem. Another problem is that this is a little wasteful. Notice that, for example, if this city disappears from the map, the boundary, which is what we're interested in, wouldn't change at all. Right? Because this guy goes away, its neighborhood gets absorbed by the neighborhoods of these you know, other cities, and the boundary stays in exactly the same place. So I could actually get rid of a bunch of data points. Now, you know, in this toy example, that doesn't really matter. But if, but if you have a database of 10 million data points, and you could throw away 9 million of them, well, then, then why not do that, right? It would both save you a lot of memory and also make things a lot faster at, at test time, right? Because at test time, you have to compare your new point with, with the ones that are in your database. All that you need to remember are the points that cause the boundary to stay where it is, also known as the support vectors. They're called vectors because examples are typically vectors, and they're called support vectors because they're literally, they're literally holding up the frontier. And, and so, so what support vector machines do is precisely that. They get rid of all the vectors that aren't support vectors yet. How do you decide which variable or which characteristics to take account of? Like if you had the patient's uh, middle initial that probably wouldn't be very useful to decide whether they had the disease. So there's a lot of things that may or may not be relevant. So in the plane, so this is the Achilles heel of the basic nearest neighbor algorithm, is that these irrelevant variables will really mess it up. In particular, if there's many more irrelevant variables than relevant ones, they, it, it will basically kill them. Whereas, for example, symbolic methods, they don't have a problem with that because they will, they will learn to select out those variables. But support vector machines actually do that very well, but they do it implicitly. When they select the support vectors, right, if there's an irrelevant dimension, that, that dimension will become irrelevant, meaning like, you know, like they, they, they will learn to ignore that. That's kind of like... Depending on how many you have. I mean, yeah. You have I, enough. If, yes, it, partly depending on how many you have, but also depending on the regularization, right? So you're also going to try to have... You know, there, there's, when, so this was the, in support vector machines, this becomes an optimization problem. Right? And what you're trying to do is like you, you're doing a trade-off between the fit to the data, but also trying to keep you know, that, you know, the, the, the size of the weights as small as possible. In particular, support vector machines tend to, one of their advantages is that like, many of the weights wind up being zero because of the weights of the examples that were thrown away. And now, there's, there's a primal and a dual formulation of this from that are equivalent. In, in, one, in, in, the, in, 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 in one formulation, you're giving weights to the examples, but in the, in the in, in the complement formulation, those, those weights are actually on the features. So the, the support vector machine can learn to give zero weight to features that are not important. And if you don't have a lot of data, then what you have to do is you have to really have a strong complexity penalty 
so as to drive a lot of weights to zero. Otherwise, you will lose. <laughs> but you know, this this kind of like just the support vector machine version of something that happens in every machine learning. Network. Right. So, uh, how do support vector machines work? Based on a very, you know, again, fairly simple. Again, support vector machines are very mathematical, and a lot of people, you know, they're totally alienated by them. You know, like Andrew Ng has this Coursera course on machine learning, and he has a heat map of where the students most failed the quizzes after the course. And when I and when he showed this to me, there was like this big red spot. You know, this was in the talk that he gave, and I was like, I know what that red spot is. It supports vector machines, and, and sure enough, it was. But the basic idea in support vector machines is very simple. Because we're going to learn, and this also uh, you know um, um, helps address your question. We're not just going to learn any frontier between the positive and negative examples, right? As far as nearest neighbor goes, and as far as neural networks go, anything that has the positives on one side and the negatives on the other is, is fair game. The support vector machine idea is a little bit cleverer than that. It's to say the following. You know, let's suppose that you know these. Let's suppose that instead of cities, this is now a minefield. Right? This is like you know, like South Korea, North Korea, and your job is to walk across the no man's land, right? Keeping South Korea on your left and North Korea on your right. Okay, and now go. Right? Now you can you know like you can walk you know in in, in any of you know the, the infinitude of ways. But think about it, right? You really don't want to get very close to any of the landmines, right? Because because that might kill you. So what you're probably going to do is you're going to walk across the no man's land, keeping giving the landmines the widest possible berth, right? staying as far away from them as possible, maximizing your margin of safety. And in fact, this is what support vector machines do: is they maximize the margin. The margin is the distance between the frontier and the closest example. And so by maximizing the margin, on one hand, they're able to, to, to combat, you know, overfitting, like, you know, learning screws can much better than the others, because intuitively, if the frontier passes very close to, you know, one of these examples, then, you know, there's a good chance that it's actually, you know, they would have been, you know, other, you know, examples of the same class of data. So then this becomes an optimization problem, which is to, you know, like, maximize the margin, and, you know, subject to the, you know, actually, the way it's formulated is, like, you try to maximize the, um, this is this this is this is part of why people get confused. Is you, even though you're supposed to maximize the margin, what you do is you minimize the norm of the weight vector while keeping the margin constant, which turns out to be mathematically a bit it's very similar. And at the end of the day, it's just a quadratic programming problem. And in the beginning, they were just solved using the quadratic programming solver. That turns out to be incredibly inefficient because these are very sparse systems, and I know that I'm not you know there's a whole literature on how to do this fast, and and it works very very well for a lot of things. And you know, analogy-based methods in general have been used for all sorts of things, but, but probably the most wide application of them these days is in, in recommended systems. So the idea of recommended systems is to find products that you like, like for example on Netflix, like you know, Netflix wants to recommend movies for you to see. And the, and the basic idea in recommended systems, which, which really made, made the whole thing kick off, is this notion that Figuring out whether you will like a movie or a book or a song is very hard based on the properties of the object. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find, because you know, human taste is a subtle thing, what I'm going to do is find people who have similar tastes to yours and then assume that the things that they like that you haven't seen you will like as well. And how do I decide that people have similar tastes to yours? Well, for example, in the case of Netflix, it's by the ratings. So if I'm trying to recommend a movie for you, I'm going to look for the people who, you know, gave five stars when you gave five stars and one star when you gave one star. And then if there's a new movie that they just gave five stars to and you've never seen, well, then, then maybe that's a movie that you like. Okay. Very simple principle, but incredibly effective. You know, like every e-commerce site worth its salt, you know, has a recommended system these days. And like three quarters of Netflix's business comes from the recommended system and the third of Amazon's. So a third, of, well, a third of what Amazon sells is, is, is something that, you know, that the recommended system uh, proposed. Okay. And of course, these days, you know, just as with spam filtering, you know, people have used all kinds of machine learning that, you know, to, do, um, you know, to, do to do recommendation. But the analogy-based methods, you know, they, they actually, not only were they the first one, they're still one of the best ones. And, and you know, they're pretty hard to beat. And you know, they're one of the simplest. So if you have to implement the recommended system in, in, like, you know, in one afternoon, you know, you could just use an algorithm like this. Okay, so let's take a step back and summarize what we've seen. 
we've met the five tribes of machine learning. We've seen that each of these tribes has a problem that it knows how to solve better than all the others. And you know, like a lot of very brilliant people have spent decades working on, on that problem. So, you know, um, they definitely produce things of great value. So the simplest in particular, they're the only ones who know how to learn composable knowledge. And they do it using inverse deduction. The connection is said the best solution to the correct assignment problem and, and its back propagation. The evolutionary is unlike the connections, they actually know, you know, the, the connections can just learn parameters, you know, continuous weights. The evolutionary can actually learn structure using generic programming. The Bayesians, of course, their obsession is the problem of uncertainty, and they have the best and most principled solution to that, which is, you know, to use probabilistic inference. And finally, the analogizers, because they can reason by similarity, they can actually learn from less data than anybody else. If I just give you two data points, one positive and, and one negative, these guys will all be hopelessly confused, and, you know, the analogy-based methods will have no problem with that at all. They can also generalize farther than the other guys. Like, for example, you know, when Niels Bohr proposed the model of the atom, like the first quantum mechanical theory was based on an analogy between the atom and the solar system. You know, where, you know, where the nucleus is like the sun and electrons are like the planets. And this is an amazing leap to, you know, to be able to make. And the analogies are the ones who can do the kind of like very far type of induction. And, you know, and the most widely used anal you know, analogy-based method is kernel machine. Now, the people in each of these tribes, the more optimistic ones, you know, some of, you know, they believe that, you know, they have the answer. Like, you know, for example, these days, you know, decade by decade, a different one of these schools tends to be on the ascendant. So, you know, the decade, you know, right now it's the connectionist, but the decade before that it was the analogizer, before it was the visions. And, you know, so right now some of the more optimistic connectionists think they're going to solve everything using backpack. But the thing to realize is that because each of these problems is a real one, None of these algorithms is actually the final answer, right? Because, you know, it's not enough to solve credit this time. You also have to solve composability and, and, and structure learning and whatnot. So what we really need is a single algorithm that unifies all these five. We need a grand unified theory of machine learning, not unlike, you know, physicists have a grand unified theory that unifies electricity and magnetism and the strong and weak nuclear forces and and of course, this is kind of unified with gravity, but what we need is something like that in machine learning. One algorithm that will be the true master algorithm that can actually solve all of these five. And indeed, you know, in the last decade, a lot of people have worked on this, and you know, I, you know, I found myself among them, and we've actually made a remarkable amount of progress. So how can we do that? How can we combine these five algorithms into one? And, you know, at first this seems very difficult. In fact, some people in the past even claimed that it was impossible. These days it's getting hard to, to believe that because they look so different. But the thing to realize is that even though they look superficially very different, they all have the same basic structure. And if we understand that structure, you know, we're, we're halfway there. So what is that structure? Every learning algorithm is really composed of three pieces. The first piece is representation. Your choice of language in which you write what you've learned. So if you're learning a program, if you're writing a program, you might write it you know, in Java or, you know, or, or, you know, or Python or, or whatever. Right? In machine learning, we tend to use things like first order logic that are like, you know, are more abstract and more general and use it to work with, but you need to choose a language. Right? So representation is your first choice. The second one is evaluation. Out of all the hypotheses that your language allows, how do I decide, you know, how, you know, which is the better hypothesis? You know, how do I score each hypothesis as to how good it is? And finally, there's optimization, which is the process by which I search for the best hypothesis, you know, in that representation according to this evaluation measure. So if we can, if we can unify the representation, the evaluation, and the optimization components of these algorithms, then we're done. We actually have one grand unified algorithm that does, you know, everything that all the others, uh, that, that the individual wants to. So one way of doing this, you know, the, the one, you know, so, so how far along we are we in this? We're actually pretty far along. So how can we, you know, so let's start by trying to unify the representation, right? So how can we do that? Well, as I mentioned already, the symbolists, uh, the language that they use, and in fact all of computer science in one form or another is really just using first order logic as the representation. So if you use first order logic, you know, you're already unifying a lot of things already pretty far along. 
Now, of course, the problem with logic, you know, you know, infamously in AI is that it's too little, right? It's very black and white. So you need to deal with uncertainty, right? Oh, well, that's what the Bayesians know how to do. And the Bayesians represent uncertain, uh, you know, uh, models using things like Bayesian networks and Markov networks, which are collectively known as graphical models. And graphical models already unify under them pretty much every type of statistical model that, that people, you know, that people have used, you know, since, since time immemorial. So if we can unify first order the logic and graphical models, we're actually well on our way. We have a representation that's good enough for everything that we might want to learn. And this, you know, we haven't even been able to do that, right? There's various kinds of what I call probabilistic logics. The most widely used one is called Markov logic networks, which is really just the following simple idea. So as the name implies, it's a unification of first order logic and Markov networks. And it just consists of saying, I'm going to give a weight to every formula. So, you know, every form of first order logic, I'm going to give a weight. The weight is high if I strongly believe in that formula and low if it's kind of like the weaker thing. Okay. And then the probability of the state of the world is just the sum of the weights of the formulas that are true in the world exponentially the normalized. So, you know, it's a Logan model or exponential family model or Maxent model for those of you who are familiar with, with, with that one. Okay. So we, we have that. We have, you know, a representation that unifies the two. It's just logical formulas with weights representing a very big Logan model or, or, or Markov now. Now, what about the evaluation? Well, people use things, you know, like, and all these schools tend to use different measures like, you know, accuracy, squared error, cross entropy, etc., etc. But, you know, most of those are just simple special cases of, of the posterior probability that we saw after coefficient learning. So one possible, you know, evaluation measure to use is, is posterior probability. But a better, a better evaluation measure to use is actually none. Is to say, the mass around them actually should not say a priori what the evaluation is going to be. The evaluation should come from the user. It's you, the user, who should tell the algorithm what it is that it's supposed to be optimizing. So if you're a company, you know, like the, the objective function might be, you know, your profits or your return on investment or, or whatever. If you're an individual, it should be, you know, some measure of your happiness, like, you know, how much you enjoy the movies and the books and, and, and whatnot. So you should put that in. And then whatever it is, then the algorithm should optimize, should learn something to optimize that. Which brings us to the last part, which is optimization. Okay. And, now, and now for optimization, there's a very natural, considering that we're doing this in, you know, in what are called Markov logic networks, right? So they have the weights and they have the formulas as well. To learn the formulas, we can use genetic programming because a formula is a type of program. It's a tree of ands and ors and whatnot, so natural match there. And then to learn the weights, well, backpropagation is the natural thing to do there. Right? You have a chain of reasoning, which is like a big graph of, you know, rule applications leading to new facts, applied to more rules. Well, these rules now all have weights, right, because it's Markov logic, it's not just logic. And I can backpropagate through my chain of reasoning in order to learn those weights. So we're actually, you know, pretty far along in terms of unifying the five paradigms. And, you know, some people believe that once we unify them, you know, we'll be done. I actually don't think that's the case. I think there are some really major ideas in machine learning that are yet to be discovered, that none of the five schools <coughs> has. In fact, part of my motivation for writing the book was try to get people from outside the field to get interested in the problem and, you know, start having ideas. Because I think those new ideas are actually more likely to come from people outside the field than, than from the people who are, you know, professional machine learning researchers and, and already thinking along a specific track. So, you know, if you have such an idea, you know, please let me know so I can publish it. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we go back one second? Mm -hmm. So, this unification, I mean, it feels like indeed what you're doing is trying to subsume these different parts, right? But in some sense, I would expect there would be a cost to that. And in particular, you know, in some cases, the algorithm benefits a lot from not having to allow full generality. And that means with a smaller amount of data, you get to the answer faster. Now, you might believe that it's missed an important part of the model important pieces missing from the model, you've lost something important. Are you worried that sort of going down this road is going to lead us to a world where, you know, for lots of problems, we're just simply going to have not enough data to be able to train something like yeah, that? Yeah, this is a great question. And there's really two parts to this. One is computational efficiency. And then, you know, anything that is this powerful is going to be a big computational headache. And that is a lot of where the research is and needs to be, right? It's one thing to have done the unification in theory. It's another thing to have something that works with the computational part that we have. So that's one side. The other, one, the other side is avoiding overfitting, right? So 
the more powerful, the more general representation, the more you are in danger of overfitting. But the way that's avoided here, something that I kind of like didn't really talk about, is that the algorithms, for example, we have an implementation of this, you know, it's an open source system called Alchemy, right, that, that does all of these things. And, and, and what, what, what these algorithms do is like they actually take two inputs. They don't just take data as the input, they also take your prior knowledge as the input. And your prior knowledge, for example, could be such that it causes this to be a logistic regression. So, you know, like one of the basic exercises, you know, that I get people to do in Markov logic is implement a logistic regression with two formulas, or implement the hidden Markov model, or implement your favorite type of model. So, the, you know, so for the problem that you're solving, right, you're not going to throw the full thing at it unless you have huge amounts of data. You're going to say, like, well, what are the assumptions that I'm willing to make, and that I have to make given the amount of data that I have? And those could go any, you know, like, so, so that knowledge is very powerful. That knowledge could be anything from like rigidly implementing a very narrow class of statistical model to a whole, you know, to site, right? The famous site knowledge base. We did a project with the folks at SciCore where we turned, you know, the part of site, you know, this was for a DARPA, you know, one of those pilot projects, where we turned a part of the site knowledge base into the prior knowledge that you can then start, you know, learning more formulas and modifications of the formulas and weights on. So that's, this is how things actually work in practice. So Pedro, I'm Afraid we're out of yeah. time. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to go uh, buy his book on Amazon, which I'm sure will recommend many other uh, interesting books uh, using their algorithms, um, or go directly to his website. Um, I want to uh, remind you that next week we have Louis Von Ahn, uh, seven days from today, uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, coming here to speak.